right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Head Crack After Hours in the Morning. Hustle is a dude, man, who's been on his grind for a minute. You used to see a lot of them. Now you see less of them, but you're about to see more of them. All right? It's my man, Jason Lee from Hollywood Unlocked. What's going on, homie? Hey, what's good? It's been a minute. It has been a hot minute. So a lot has changed since our last interactions because you used to pull up on us on Dish Nation from time to time. Yeah. Uh, this thing called COVID popped off. Um, you, you got like a syndicated weekly radio show between point A and point B, or it hasn't expanded to beyond just the weekly radio show. And then you got this new thing on Fox Soul, Hollywood Unlocked with Jason Lee Uncensored. Yeah, I mean, we've been working. COVID has definitely stopped a lot of the in-person interaction. Well, not really stopped, it's limited it for sure. But uh, yeah, we, you know, the national show still weekends on iHeart. We are talking with them about doing more over there. And there's been other opportunities of come up since then that we're looking at. And then Fox Soul, yeah, now we're over there and um, and growing really quickly with them. Yeah, so, you know, a lot of people like went into COVID, they got these new Grimace built bodies, but uh, you coming out looking like, you know, a dangerous Drake. <laughs> you know what, it's, for me, it started with surgery to be just quite transparent. You know, I've been very open about the, my journey and losing weight and getting fit. Um, you know, for me, it was less about the outside. It was more about I had become pre-diabetic. I had inflammation. I had developed sleep apnea and I was, you know, turning 43. And so I just said to myself, you know, I gave myself a year saying that if I did everything I could to try to do it organically and couldn't happen, I was going to start with the surgery. But surgery really was... Um, sort of like um, it was a, a jump start, you know, to the process mm -hmm. because I had to change my diet. I cut all sugar, carbs, uh, red meat. I cut a lot of stuff out of my diet and have really been disciplined in myself. No alcohol, um, just really focused on, uh, you know, becoming more healthy and fit because I want to live longer. That makes sense. What's been the hardest thing out of all those things for you to shake? Well, um, you know, I like steak. So I used to love going to the steakhouse here in LA. Lay and I, I love steak, but you know, uh, when you have the surgery and I had the VSG, VSG surgery, which is the sleeve, uh, your stomach really, it's a new stomach. So it teaches you what you can eat and what you can't eat. My body just responds very differently to foods that I used to like. And so uh, that first two months of, of juicing and eating soft foods and not really eating like I used to eat, I lost interest in eating a lot of things, you know, sugar, don't, I'm not interested in sugar. So you can get natural sugars from fruit. And it really started a whole journey of self-love for me. It was, you know, it was one of those things where I felt like I had, I'd been able to create the show and create this net, the radio show and create Hollywood Online and get on Dish Nation, Wendy and all these different things. But I had somehow hadn't found a way to take control of my own life. And, and it really started to get into my head about how I needed to, to um, love myself more first. That's what's up, man. Well, yo, it looks great on you, man. I hope uh, that journey continues to inspire others. Cause like, I hadn't seen you in a while. And then, you know, my manager was talking really fondly about uh, the, the, you know, the gag show, you know, Juju was doing it all live for a second. And I was like, yo, I somehow I've been missing it. So I tapped this like, yo, who the hell? Oh, snap. You know what I mean? And, and usually when people I, drop weight I, like that, they'd be like, yo, is he okay? Well, no, I've had some people, uh, I, you know, I had somebody come on my Instagram the other day and said, oh, is he sick? I'm like, am I sick? Bitch, I'm healthy, you know? And <laughs> <laughs> and and um, I, I've lost 86 pounds in four months. I mean, that's a lot of, it's a tremendous amount of weight, you know, and thankfully, you know, I don't look like a pop balloon. My, my skin is snapping back and I did build a gym at my house. So I'm in the gym and um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not on OnlyFans yet. Uh, but, you know, I'm not going to say I would never be, you know? <laughs> Coming soon. So here's the thing, Jason Lee, you know a lot about everybody, but I want to know more about you. Who was Jason Lee as a kid? What was your childhood like? So uh, since I saw you, and I got to get you a copy, I, I, I wrote a book called God Must Have Forgotten About Me. And I talked a lot about my upbringing, uh, you know, raised by a single mother who ended up getting addicted to drugs. Um, I ended up going into foster care, came out of foster care, got shot, watched my brother get murdered. Um, and then just really um, spent the rest of my life really trying to uh, stay above the water, really, where I felt like life was, I was drowning. Mm -hmm. And um, I think what the industry and meeting Queen Latifah, you know, that became a really big source of inspiration for me uh, to be able to see a light outside of my community where everything around me was just death and destruction. And I was able to 
use just my um, desire for pop culture and, you know, the business of pop culture to really be a driving force in me um, becoming successful and overcoming all of the obstacles that were put in front of me. So uh, J the young Jason Lee was a dreamer, you know, had a lot of ideas, uh, had a lot of, um, you know, inquiries into what life had to offer. And I've, I'm just thankful that I was able to see all of my turmoil through to be able to get to enjoy a lot of that. I can dig it. Now, uh, you mentioned like, you know, being a, in foster care, you know, some people call it the group home. Were you one of those kids who aged out or did you, you know, kind of move on before you had to move out? Yeah, no, my mother, she ended up, um, you know, getting uh, off of drugs uh, before I aged out. So I came home at 14. I went in when I was turning eight years old. Um, and so I didn't age out. I did go back with my mother. You know, she then got back into drugs later on when I was an adult and I ended up having to adopt my younger brother uh, for 10 years. He, I raised him. And so, yeah, I was able to go through the group home and foster home experience, which I talk a lot about in the book, and then uh, come out of that on the other side. Yo, a very chiseled existence. You know, I can identify, you know, as a person who came from a background where, you know, both of his parents did drugs. You know, you forced to grow up so fast and have to take people under your wing. You know, was there ever something that you felt like you, you know, you lacked in your childhood because, you know, you had to move differently. It was more about survival for you. Yeah, survival, that's really the word that comes across a lot of my book too, because, uh, you know, surviving the foster care system, surviving the streets, you know, before my mother uh, gave me up and even after coming back and integrating it back into the community where I had been so isolated uh, and, you know, taking those skills and applying them to business and being able to continue to stay a step ahead of, you know, my uh, com com competition in the businesses that I work for and then also with my bosses and how they were thinking and I was able to really uh, learn how to I don't want to say finesse, but finesse really is the word I think <laughs> of. You know, that's my way through life, you know, and survival has just been something that I will say has been a blessing through it all. You know, when you look at um, the group home system or foster care or, or growing up in the hood, like we learn skills that you can't teach at Harvard, you know, mm -hmm. and, and if you apply them properly to business, if you just translate what you do on the streets to how you want to move in the boardroom, you can become the biggest, most powerful person in any industry that you want to dominate. Dope. Now, you know, I told people a lot of times, you know, how like my journey through life, it was very like slumdog millionaire. Like there was a lot of things I would do as a kid. I never understood why I was doing it, but it all paid off later. Like, you know, why at five years old was I staying up late watching Entertainment Tonight? Like why? Then later on, you get the gig of Dish Nation, you know who all these white people are that you would have probably not have known had it not been that. What were some of those situations for you? Because it seems like, you used everything, you know, that you encountered growing up to apply that science to what you do today. I mean, I look at my work in the labor union and being able to tell stories and, and messaging and talking to people and leading groups of people and how I was able to sit at the table with, you know, Kaiser Permanente and negotiate these high level worker agreements and just, and resolve disputes. And then now I look at myself as an employer with nine employees and all of the stuff that I have to know and being able to lead effective teams or being able to make sure our message is on point. Uh, I think, you know, in in watching Arsenio Hall and the different shows that I watched growing up, I now look at what I'm doing and I find myself, you know, um, not really doing what they did, but I look at them, I look at Howard Stern, I look at Charlemagne, I look at you when I used to go to Dish Nation and just your energy and how you moderated and kept it all moving. And I've taken bits and pieces from everybody and just tried to do my own thing, put my own spice on it. So, yeah, I think we all, you know, grow up in life and 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 learn from the best, hopefully those that want to be somebody or be something. And, um, you know, I'm just one of those people. That's what's up. What was your very first job that you ever held? My very first job, my grandfather, uh, he's Italian, his name is John Stathatos. He got me a job working at a pizzeria. I was 15 years old. And uh, it's funny, I'll tell you how I lost that job. I learned nothing from that job other than to always tell the truth. I wanted to get out of work to go to an E40 concert because I had developed a relationship with Sugar T. And uh, she had invited me to all backstage passes, all this. And that was a big deal at the time. I was only 15 years old. So I uh, told them that I had to go to my grandmother's funeral. And they let me out 
to go to my grandmother's funeral, but I really went to an E40 concert. Well, when I came back, they wanted to see proof that I had gone to a funeral because they thought that I, they had suspected I was lying. You know, there was no social media, so they didn't see anything. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I actually went to Kinko's and made an obituary for my grandmother. I like your style. And, uh, <laughs> but the thing is, is that I actually put the name of an actual church on the, 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 the program and so they called to verify and there was no funeral so I got caught lying I got fired but I guess the lesson in that was don't lie you know yo but who goes that deep to well, I gotta salute your you know ability to like you know use the whole Kinko's angle because that was my whole thing I used to get into so many events because I would laminate shit like I yeah. would get like all the media passes from like different labels I would laminate I was at every event I worked for nobody but for the employer to call around to the churches to even find out if there was a funeral happening that day. Yeah. There was tenacity on both sides. He he did a lot. He he outsmarted me, but I will say, you know, like you lamin- doing the laminations and all that. In the book, I talk about how I met Queen Latifah. I snuck backstage. I lied to security. Somebody took our credentials. They gave us passes. I was only uh, uh, 16 at the time, 15, 16 at the time. But again, that goes back to what I learned that I've always had that drive. I always had that ambition. If I want it bad enough, I'm gonna do whatever it takes to get it, you know? And that really does separate the people who wanna do it and the people who actually do it, you know? Indeed. So I, I, I never, I mean, I, I've laminated passes. I've, you know, I, I, I mean, I finessed a photographer when I was 16 and a half to become like her assistant. I used that letter of assistant to get in other stuff. So. Yeah, I mean, that is just the hustle. I've always had that hustle in me. Now, just this is the rap nerd in me coming out. That concert you went to was around the time they had Sprinkle Me, man, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Actually, actually, it was before Sprinkle Me. I mean, oh. I don't know. Yeah, E-40 and them, you know, I'm from Northern California, so they from Vallejo. Uh, they used to come to our city, Stockton, and bring uh, 40 bottles of Old English and line them up, and everybody would come to the turf, to the hood, and then they would he would give out his CDs and stuff, so... Yeah, I mean, it was it was before that. I think that was just when they were just the click. Okay, okay. So yeah, you deeply rooted in this thing. That's dope. So I right, so the Queen Latifah meeting, you know, was one of those things that changed your life. Was that the first celebrity you met? Queen Latifah was she the first celebrity that I actually met? Um, she may have been the first celebrity that I met. I can't remember because it's been so many and so long. But yeah, she may have been one of the first few. Yeah, got you. And. You fast forward to 2020 where, you know, Jason Lee, your openly gay man, years ago, cats would have to fly low. How do you feel operating in the space that we are in right now to where you could be who you are and inspire people who maybe feel a certain way about how they may be perceived in a public space? Yeah, somebody recently asked me what was my coming out story. And I said, shit, I never came out. I just was out. You know what I mean? Like, (laughs) but I I do remember days when I was growing up in the hood and I had, you know, brothers and cousins and, you know, I was around, you know, the people that I was around. It was just not something that you, you, you did or talked about. Uh, But I think it was one of those things where like over time, I just said, I'm going to live my life and people are going to find out who I am in all ways, business, creativity, gay, whatever. They're just going to discover who I'm as a person as they discover. I don't feel like I need to make a proclamation. I don't need to sit my family down and have a dinner to tell them who I'm sleeping with. So uh, I think over time, I just, you know, evolved into being who I am. And the more I've grown into who I am and being being comfortable in, in the totality of who I am, I've just forced others to. And there's some people that, you know, when I went to a while and out, I remember, you know, it was kind of shared that, you know, maybe some of the cast members were not comfortable with gay people or the gay comedy. And uh, I came in and and when we did our intros, I raised my hand. I said, I'm 40, I'm gay, and I'm going to be gay on the show. And I'm going to say a lot of gay shit. And I'm going to always be respectful. And I'll make sure, you know, uh, you know, it's going to be fun. And, th- and I've seen the cast evolve over time and becoming more comfortable with it because the reality is, is that there are kids sitting at home right now who are me. Mm-hmm. Uh, gay and don't know where they're going to go in life because now with social media, cyberbullying is a real thing. And, you know, I hope that they can say, damn, like he, he, he did syndicated radio, TV, reality shows, comedy shows, talk show, he's doing it all. And who he is as a person being gay does not prohibit him from being a creative. Indeed, indeed. And, you know, it's dope to see 
images of gay people doing a thing. You know what I mean? Like some people like, you know, especially like hetero dudes, like it could be so toxic sometimes because like once you realize that, hey, bro, they don't want you. I, you know, I think that's like part of the biggest thing. Like, yo, nothing's going to happen. You're not going to get sexually assaulted because there's someone who, you know, who is, who is a bisexual or openly gay around or on the set. Yeah. And I think also, uh, I think it's also good to see that we all don't wear purses and makeup. You know what I mean? I think that there's a certain image that the media, specifically white media, puts out about black gay men that, you know, we all wear uh, chandelier hats or fucking, you know, we're all wearing <laughs> makeup and high heels. And, you know, I mean, that's not all of who we are. But I, I blame, you know, like Housewives of Atlanta. I really feel like a lot of those those people on that show used a lot of gay black men, stereotypical gay black men to highlight as trinkets or accessories. And I, you know, it, it, it causes a lot of conversations in our own community where we're all looking at each other like, yo, we ain't all that. But not mm -hmm. to say that that's bad. It's just like, there's space for everybody. There's space for all of us. But I just didn't like how like mainstream media would just use an image of what the black gay man looked like uh, which was very polarizing too. Now, Jason, in your opinion, who has been an example of just a very minstrelly gay character in pop culture? Charlemagne. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just playing. I have a lot of fun with Charlemagne because he is so comfortable with himself. He plays a lot of gay shit. Um, mm -hmm. You know, um, damn, who? Well, one person I will say who does a lot of the stuff I just described is uh, Billy Porter. I know he, you know, he lives in and outside of all of that, but he, what I've been able to appreciate about Billy is how he really pushes the line uh, for, for what he believes should be acceptable uh, from mainstream, the mainstream community. Um, I think uh, James Baldwin was another person uh, who I think was a great example you know, uh, for our community. And I think there's a lot of people that are out there doing their own thing. I just, you know, I just try to live as an individual who happens to be gay. I don't uh, really push the gay thing out outside of my show. In my mm -hmm. show, I do push a lot of boundaries, you know, um, but yeah, I, I think there's a lot of people that are doing their thing. Lil Nas X, he's letting, he's letting white makeup artists paint him down. I guess now he's just all the way out. I don't know. I don't know half of what's gimmick and what's real these right. days. So I just uh, I just pray that people learn acceptance of all people who do whatever they do. Yeah, now it baffles me just how people get so affected or so riled up by things that don't really directly affect them. You know, I saw this thing the other day with, uh, I think it was Harry Styles or somebody like that. He was on like Vanity Fair wearing a dress and Candace Owens was like, where the manly man at? Well, guess what? They're probably not on the cover of Vanity Fair. You're looking at the wrong place if you're looking for manly dudes. And like, yo, let Harry Styles is on his androgynous rock star shit. It is what it is. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we've been talking a lot about that, but I think she's a troll who knows how to get us talking about her. And I, you know, I know she's pregnant, and she should be really careful because, as one of my co-hosts said on my show, her her kid can come out farting glitter. The next <laughs> end up being gay. And then, you know, now you have to look at the words that you've said about gay people or people who may be androgynous or whatever they're doing, you know, uh, you just gotta be really careful. And I just think we live in a world now where, you know, people are seeking attention on a daily basis. And Candace Owens is one of those who has learned how to do it. No doubt. Now, uh, talking about your show, uh, you know, Hollywood Unlocked, you know, you guys are full throttle. It's a fun vibe over there. Um, because you do what you do, Jason, does it become difficult sometimes to maintain friendships and relationships because you do sometimes have to talk about people you know and it can get uncomfortable? That's uh, been a reoccurring question as of late because my opinions have been very um, controversial on a lot of different things. And yeah, I think it's becoming more complicated now uh, only because uh, people are, people are struggling with learning how to accept my job, right? I have a job, you have a job, they have a job. I have never called one of the artists that I'm friends with to say, hey, love your album, but that song number six really sucks shit. 
Uh, you put out the song without my approval. You put out the song hoping I would like it. I didn't, but I don't need to call you and tell you that just like you don't need to tell me you like what I said or what story I put out. And so I really look for, you know, friends that happen to be celebrities. They just, those, and there's very few, there's really only like three. Um, they get that I have a job to do and they understand they have no influence over how I do my job. And uh, our relationship is not based on the celebrity nor my job. So it, there's a mutual respect there and I don't really struggle. Everybody else at this point, I've just said, please don't call me. It, it, it is what it is. If you have a problem with what I say or do, come on one of my shows and talk about it or don't talk to me about it, you know? Yeah. Now, who are your top three, like, you know, close celebrity friends? Like, who's your buddy buddy? I mean, if I say them, then the, all the other people who think they may be close, because I'm going to tell you, hey, I'll help you preserve those relationships. Never let mind. Me tell you, <laughs> let me tell you what people are doing, though. Like, people think because they become friendly with me that that somehow controls, protects them, protects them and controls how I do what I do. And they get butt hurt whenever I have to do my job. And all of a sudden there's a headline or a story that we post that that's not favorable to them. You know, I will say one person is an example who I really respect is Offset. You know, I've had to write some stuff about him that he hasn't liked. And I did see him recently uh, at, a, at an event and I thought, oh shit, yeah, this is not gonna go well, you know? And he walked up to me and he said, you know, I don't really like the headlines that y'all be using and it's your staff be writing about me, but I respect that you got a job to do and I'm working on me. And, uh, you know, I, I want to do an interview with you. And I was like, I really respected that, you know, because that that really is the symbiotic relationship that all of us have to have with one another because I'm not going away. And in fact, I'm growing. And as I evolve and grow, I'm going to just continue to become uh, more and more loud with what I think. That's a dope space to be in, especially like, you know, where you can say what you say with your chest and you don't have to like hold your breath when people like approach you about shit because you know you you know the space you operating in so that's dope um when you think about 2020 it's totality jason what are like five of the most fucked up stories of 2020 that really stuck out in your head man celebrity wise yeah i mean you know it doesn't even have to be in a celebrity space like when you walk away from 2020 with everything that it's been what are the five ones that ring your bell the most i mean four of them involve trump you know, for me, you know, I just, uh, I just today, literally an hour ago, reached out to Hillary Clinton because I want to interview her. One thing I was thinking about was the big debate. Uh, and this wasn't in 2020, this was back in 2016, but I mean, it's, it's permeated for the last four years, is that like her losing the election, although a lot of people did not like Hillary, I would have always said we have to take the best of the we have to take the best of the two evils that we have to choose from, right? Mm -hmm. So over this year, the biggest headlines I think have bothered me have involved Donald Trump. I mean, kids in the cages at the borders here in California, right. the mishandling of coronavirus, which has fucked off all of our lives and all of our business in every industry. Uh, you know, uh, well, Chloe taking Tristan Thompson back with some bullshit, but you know, I'm, I, I, <laughs> I always yeah. felt that was a plot line to begin with. As much things as the Kardashians have done for them to break up over a kiss, bruh, no, but it really, it re I don't know if the breakup was a part of the storyline because I really don't know how that all war works, but you know, we broke the story about Jordan. So I know that it was a real deal thing. Uh, but yeah, just her taking it back and just all of that. Um, there's been a lot of headlines this year that's been uh, been messy, but I will say as bad as COVID has been for the business, if, you, if you're like me, it has actually been a good restart for my life. You know, it's allowed us to slow down. You know, you and I, and those of us that are in this business, it's always a chase, always a grind, mm -hmm. it's always a hustle. And it slowed us all down enough to be able to really like take stock of what's going on in our own lives. So it's not been that bad for me. All right. Now I know you are, you're super plugged in. I feel like you have nanny cams strategically placed in various celebrities homes all throughout the country, possibly certain parts of the world. What's one story that we haven't dropped yet or that you haven't dropped yet? And it could be a blind item that we'll probably hear about soon. Some things that you, you, you're you in the know about, but the shoe ain't hit the floor yet on the other foot. Um, why Kylie and Travis really broke up. Mm. Yeah, I'm, where, I'm working on that one. I just, you know, it's just the timing has to be right. And I have to, you know, it's a couple more I's that need to be dotted. But yeah, why they really broke up, people don't know. Is there a person who uh, has a name of a horse involved in that in any way, by any chance? No. No, okay, oh. okay, mm -hmm. just checking, just checking. All right, then, cool. Well, yo, I'm excited about the new show, bro. 
Fox Soul, you in good hands. Shout out to the homie James the Bose over there. It's dope to see you executive producing this situation. Before we ride out, I want to do a game with you. It's called Off Top. I'm going to throw some questions at you. You got to answer the question off top. Like, don't even really think about it. Okay, Blurt the first thing to go to mind. I know you built for this game, Jason Lee. All right. Now, out of everybody in Hollywood, who got the most bodies in the biz? Bodies. Um. Oh, shit. Bodies in the biz. Uh, oh, who they slept with in the biz. Oh, definitely one of the Kardashians. All of them. Damn, threw them all in the trash. Okay, cool. Out of all the celebrities you've dealt with, who has the worst attitude? Lauren Hill. Damn. If Blank shows up to the party, I'm leaving. Tristan Thompson. Why? Wait, am I leaving? I just thought, I just asked myself that same question. <laughs> nobody, I'm, I'm really not leaving. I mean, you know, I'm really not leaving. Nobody. Okay, cool. Who is one person? That you'd fuck them and take them shopping. Fuck them and take them shopping. Oh, uh, Kelly Obrey. I gotta Google that person. Kelly Obrey. Why is that name sound? Play, basketball player for the Phoenix Suns. Okay, cool. Now he's on the radar. In one word, who is Jason Lee? A boss. Boss. Fuck with it. I fuck with it. Uh, also, Jason, gotta big you up when Wendy was on your show, Hollywood Unlocked. Uh, she was talking about the guy behind the tape. That was a good alley oop. You put you put me in with the cougar crowd. I went, went, I, that wasn't me, Wendy. I, I asked Wendy who she was ready to take down. She said you. You, you slightly look disgusted when you when she said my name. No, no, no because when I because you're like to me you're like so dope and wholesome and Wendy's like out here just talking her shit and I'm like head crap. Oh well, shit. I'm gonna link that up. <laughs> Word, nah, that, it was a super good look, man. I, I appreciate you for, you know, for putting that out there to the universe. And yo, man, continue success um, for people to pick up your book because it sounds like there's a lot of things in there that can help people out. Where can they go and what's it called again? Yeah, God must have forgot about me. Go uh, check it out on Amazon. It's 4.7 out of five stars. It's actually good. It's really a good book. It's the thing I'm the most proud of. And James DeBose, who you mentioned, I met at Dish Nation with you guys, you know, mm -hmm. him uh, keeping us in mind and creating this opportunity for us to uh, me to executive produce my first show and, and bring it over to Fox. So, man, I'm so grateful to him. So check that out every Friday, 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on Fox. Soul. hey, yo, we pull it up for it, man. Jason Lee, continue success. Keep uh, keep banging them out. Any word on the uh, return of Wild and Out by any chance? No, I just posted a video on my Instagram. It's out on my podcast today that I have asking Viacom to let me out of all my contracts. You know, uh, I, I get I signed up to do Love and Hip Hop, and I'm I have a contract with MTV on Wild and Out. With them firing Nick Cannon or whatever happened with them ending that partnership, you know, we've kind of just been hanging in the balance, not knowing what's happening. There are rumors that the show is coming back. Uh, but I don't have a pickup notice. And, and, you know, with COVID, we're all trying to do other things. I want to get out my contracts and go create. So I've, I basically have just said that, you know, I feel like I'm now a slave to Viacom. I've asked to be let go of all my contracts and now it's all over Instagram. And so we'll see what happens. All right. Like they used to say in the Bible, let my people go. That's Let Jason Lee know. right there. Yeah, he, he's unlocked every Friday night on Fox. So be sure you check it out. 7 p.m. Pacific time, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Man, pull up. It's definitely a vibe. Thank you, Jason.